Thank you. Welcome to Concordia University Presents the Walrus Talks, Living Better. Who doesn't want to live better? I'm Shelley Ambrose, Executive Director of the Walrus, and we are thrilled to be here on the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Piton First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit, here in the lovely Isabel Bader Theater. There is, as you know, a rich history of sharing and conversation here at the University of Toronto and in our great city, and it's great to be here with you to continue having conversations about important matters. We at the Walrus know that you have many things to do with your time, so we're really chuffed when you decide to spend an evening with us, so thanks for coming out. This optimistic project called The Walrus started 16 years ago, and we re recognize at The Walrus that Canada's conversation is complex and necessary, and so it takes many forms at The Walrus. We create conversations through fact-based journalism in The Walrus magazine and daily at thewalrus.ca. We publish The Walrus books, and we gather people in rooms like this from coast to coast to coast for the walrus talks. So no matter where the walrus is or how it is consumed, we embrace our commitment to be independent and to bring together interesting and interested people who care about the issues that matter. So here's my favorite game. Hands up if you read the walrus. Yay, thank you very much. Hands up if you support the journalism financially by subscribing or donating. Those are the true walri. Those are my people. Okay, there's, um, okay, hands up if you've attended a Walrus Talks before. Welcome back. Hands up if you're new. Let's welcome the new people. <laughs> new Walry. Happy to meet you. There is no way we can do the work that we do without you, and there is no way we can do the work that we do without our partners. One of our strongest, longest partnerships is with Concordia University. And I think we have some Concordia alumni with us tonight. Excellent, welcome Concordia. Thank you for being with us. We've been working with Concordia for several stellar years as part of what they call Thinking Out Loud series. And this year, Concordia actually enabled the Walrus for the first time in our 16-year history to host a conversation vital to Canadians outside of Canada. In September, Concordia traveled with the Walrus to New York, and we hosted the Walrus uh, talks at the Canadian consulate there, bringing this kind of conversation to both expats and a lot of uh, Canada watchers in the U.S. People are kind of clinging to us on our way out the door. <laughs> Take us with you. Anyway, uh, thank you, Concordia. Since our first meeting with Concordia way back when, we've been very impressed by the way they design programs to prepare their alumni to be at the forefront of innovation in all sectors and to use their education and research to make a better world. To tell us more, please welcome Concordia University's interim provost and vice president of academic, Anne Whitelaw. Good evening, bonsoir, welcome, and hello again to our many alumni in the audience. For those of you who don't know us as well as they do, Concordia is an urban university in Montreal with two campuses. We have more than 50,000 students, um, at least 10,000 of them are international, coming from over 150 countries. During a demographic dip in higher education, we've been experiencing record applications and enrollment. And for the past few years, we've been ranked Canada's top university under 50 years old. And in fact, Quacarelli Simons has ranked us top university under 50 in North America for two years running. The ranking buzz and Concordia's momentum are generated in large part thanks to our expertise. Concordians conduct research and bring together global experts who find solutions to society's greatest challenges in many areas. We have leading centers in health, synthetic, synthetic biology, cybersecurity, smart city studies, and you're gonna hear from some of that expertise tonight, energy saving buildings, cinema studies, journalism, and the intersection of arts, culture, and technology, and many more excellent programs across the board. Tonight, you'll hear from two of our experts. Ursula Eicher, our Canada Excellence Research Chair in Smart, Sustainable, and Resilient Communities and Cities, 
and Vivek Venkatesh, UNESCO co-chair in prevention of radicalization and violent extremism and associate professor of inclusive practices in visual arts. Through our research and innovative teaching, Concordians in every discipline partner broadly to improve how we live now. That's one reason that we're part of tonight's event. The other is our fantastic partner, Shelley Ambrose and the Walrus team. Like Concordia, the Walrus does a great job of fostering dialogue in the public square. So sit back, enjoy what promises to be a stimulating evening. Thank you very much, merci. Thank you, Anne, and thanks again to everyone at Concordia for thinking out loud with us. It's awfully fun. The way we live in Canada is changing at an incredible, well, the way we live any, anywhere is changing at an incredible, maybe an alarming pace. And we all, we assume, have a desire to live better, maybe healthier, in our relationships, communities, and as global citizens. So tonight you will hear from seven talkers, writers, scientists, advocates, about opportunities and obstacles to living better. The Walrus Talks is a format designed to bring you many perspectives. The goal is when we meet each other at the post-talks reception to which you are all invited, that you leave the auditorium thinking, I never thought of it that way. So here's how the Walrus Talks works. Each talker has seven minutes. There are seven talkers and each will come up and introduce themselves. We leave the lights up, please follow along in your program. The front of your program is the order of speakers. The back of your program is their bios, in case you would like to know more about them. You will hear seven talkers in a row. Just before I let them get underway, I'd like to thank each in advance. Thank you to Nick Saul, President and CEO of Community Food Centers Canada, Thank you to Nora Young, host of CBC Radio's Spark. Thank you to Ursula Eicher, Canada Excellence Research Chair in Smart, Sustainable and Resilient Communities and Cities at Concordia University and winner of the Longest Title <laughs> Award. Thank you to Zaya Tong, science journalist and author of The Reality Bubble. Thank you to Vivek Venkatesh, UNESCO Co-Chair in Prevention of Radicalization and Violent Extremism and Associate Professor at Concordia University, Prize Two for the longest title. Thank you to Jen Gunter, gynecologist and women's health columnist and advocate. And thank you to Damian Rogers, former Walrus poetry editor, poet and author. And thank you all for coming. Let us begin. Good evening, my name is Nick Saul. When my boys were little, I mean very little, I spent much time perched on the edge of sandboxes in local parks. Young kids do a lot of what's known as parallel play. When they finally notice each other, it's often to throw sand, bite, or grab someone else's toy. And so there are parents like me everywhere urging their darlings through gritted teeth to please, please share. We spend years pushing the importance of sharing with our children. And indeed, it's a lesson that most people eventually learn and embrace. I see it on my street where we support one another with drives to doctor's appointments and baking a banana bread when required. I see it in my work with our generous volunteers and donors who give their time energy and funds to low-income communities. I was also recently struck by a few newspaper stories highlighting this desire to help. There was the Egyptian owner of a pita shop in St. John's, Newfoundland, who saw people going hungry in his adopted city and started to offer free food to homeless people once a week. Inspired by his generosity, customers began to make donations to help him keep it up. And then there was the Toronto family who were concerned about people going without food in their neighborhood. So they set up a little free pantry, essentially a, a mini food bank on their uh, front lawn that people could access any time. This kind of sharing is intimate and tangible. It's easy to see the direct impact. I think it emerges from a deep wellspring 
of empathy and that such acts are expressions of our shared humanity. At the core, they represent who we truly are as a species, social beings who need each other to thrive and survive. The problem is the scale is way, way off. In Canada alone, four million people are food insecure. That's 13% of our population. In the black community, that number soars to 29%. In Nunavut, 47% of households worry about where their next meal will come from. These are people living diminished lives because of their poverty. They're disproportionately affected by a wide range of physical and mental health issues, including heart disease, diabetes, anxiety, and depression. This is a reality that affects us all. We're not only compromised morally, but also economically, as poverty is estimated to cost us upwards of $80 billion per year. We can't possibly hope to tackle these big, serious, urgent issues with food pantries on front lawns or pitas once a week, no matter how kind, genuine, and well-meaning. The solution of enormous structural inequalities is indeed sharing, just like we tell our kids in the sandbox, only now the sandbox is exponentially bigger, and that sharing has to be as well. The promise of liberal democracy and its government is that we can secure such large-scale sharing through our democratic institutions. This means pushing governments to use our collective tax dollars to underwrite initiatives that put the needs of the many over the few. It means creating and safeguarding policy and regulations so that everyone has their basic rights met to housing, to education, to water, to food. And yet, few of us seem to believe government is able to do this anymore. Many people, especially the most marginalized, just don't feel they have a say or a stake in government. In a time of rampant disinformation, divisive social media, a house of commons that resembles that sandbox I just talked about going south, and politicians that don't follow through on their promises, it's hardly surprising that Canadians' trust in government is dwindling. It's understandable, yes, but it's also bad news for creating a more equitable world. The only way to climb out of the mess that we're in is to reclaim the political system and use it to shape our communities in our shared interest. Let me be clear, very clear, I'm not trying to say that individual acts of kindness and generosity aren't important. They are. They help build a culture of compassion. But I think we must simultaneously work at a societal level. And this requires us to engage with politics and government to forge a society that reflects our best and true selves. Democracy only works when we make our voices heard, applying pressure to bring about the change we want to see. Politics, after all, is a contact sport. We can start here in Canada by continuing to push for that elusive electoral reform, doing away with the first-past-the-post system which suffocates diversity of voice and debate. We can elect and support politicians who commit to moving away from short-termism -term and the false hope of endless growth. People who see our health and the health of the planet as their north stars guiding every decision curbing the power and influence of corporations in the public policy realm will be an essential part of this. Evidence-based research, not lobbying, bottom line thinking, and a thirst for quarterly returns must drive decisions that affect us all. Finding the courage to implement bold transformational change to meet the urgency of the vast inequalities that exist is also crucial. The discarding of Ontario's basic income pilot project, despite evidence that it was improving health, reducing stress, and increasing educational opportunities, was a massive, massive missed opportunity to address the yawning gap between the rich and everyone else. We must also foster spaces where people can come together to discover and articulate their shared interests. Let's establish nonpartisan neighborhood councils that focus on creating people-centered policies. Nonprofits are perfectly suited 
to host such councils, as they are places that have the potential to truly galvanize the voices and issues of the most ignored in our society. All of this is possible. I know it because everywhere I look, I see people caring deeply about each other. I see hope in the millions, millions upon millions of young people marching in the streets to demand their political representatives meet head on the climate emergency and its resulting inequalities. I see smaller scale but deeply radical hope in the low income people of Dartmouth North where a grassroots voter education and, cam and mobilizing campaign at our community food center there increased the number of people at the polls threefold, raising issues and concerns central to that community. I believe that we're at a moment when we have to decide if we're going to hoard or we're going to share. What kind of world do we want our children to inherit? Do we want to be biters and hitters in the sandbox or do we want to be part of a different sort of sandbox where every person has a chance to play? I think we live better when we all live better. And we live best when we are working together in our communities and through the political system to ensure everyone has a dignified seat at the table. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, I'm Nora Young. Living better has always been the ultimate promise of technology. Think of all those atomic age, better living through chemistry cliches, smoother, faster, brighter, labor-saving, efficient. It's mid-century pop culture camp, of course, but that drive for living better applies to the history of our technologies as well. We usually equate technology with a new technology. In the early going, we see it for what it is, the tools and techniques we invent to help us achieve a desired outcome, generally living better, at least for some people. We think of it as technology when we see the change it makes in our lives. After that, it just becomes life. An e-book, say, is a technology. A paper book is not, except, of course, that it is. So if living better has always been the promise and the premise of technology, what went wrong? According to a recent poll, 56% of Canadians say the big technology companies are making society a worse place. We openly talk about a tech lash. Where's my robot made indeed? When people think of big technology companies, they're probably thinking about the global titans we see as technology that touch us day to day, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Google, our smartphones maybe. They're probably not thinking about companies that make nuclear reactors or Siemens, though those too are big technology companies. So let's narrow in on those big tech companies like Facebook, Google, et al. What went wrong that we perceive these technologies as making us anxious about our privacy, not solving social isolation in spite of connectivity, divided by disinformation and hyperpartisan information, and distracted. We might point to some contingent problems in the way these technologies evolved. One, they're data-driven, which is their great strength, especially in connecting us to information and people relevant to us. But it's also problematic in terms of the click, I agree, nature of data stewardship. Data then is weaponized due to advertising as the dominant business model, which as many people have pointed out, means repeated, even compulsive engagement is the goal. Because so many of those big technology companies are social technologies, and we are deeply social creatures, that need for connection will drive us to the point of distraction, compulsion, and toxic behavior. Scalability is a business goal. The focus is on building technologies that don't just serve an interest in living better, but that have to scale to astonishing user bases. This is undergirded by venture capital funding that stresses hockey stick growth. And their scale as technological reality. We're experiencing something historically completely new, where companies go from startups in metaphorical garages to globe-spanning titans with millions or billions of users. From an innovation point of view, that astonishing scale makes it exceedingly difficult to plan for how users will adapt and use the technology differently all over the world in a range of cultural and economic contexts. These problems are well documented by critical voices in tech, and they have brought us to where we are now. But underneath these problems are there challenges with the very culture and structure of innovation. 
problems which are more visible and acute now precisely because of the issues I just pointed to. Perhaps we may be at the limits of one of the main premises of engineering and technology, that optimization is always a good. A hat tip here to my Spark colleague, Adam Killick, for raising this question about the limits of optimization the other day. In his excellent book, Coders, tech journalist Clive Thompson describes the cult of efficiency in coder culture. The problem, as he put it on Spark, is that, quote, every time you optimize something, there are some great positive effects that you intended, and there's almost always some weird, unexpected negative effects that you didn't even think about. The cultural critic Chris Gilliard points out the connection between social isolation and friction-free technology, such as apps that let us get food delivered without having to talk to someone, never mind going out to a restaurant to be around other people. Is it any wonder optimization is tied to socialization? After all, society is often not very efficient. Then there's the belief that technologists can control for everything, when the history of any technology shows us that users have an important role to play in how the technology turns out. Famously, product designer Chris Messina invented the hashtag for Twitter. Today, a global community of users shapes the direction and must be factored into design from the get-go. And crucially, there's the belief that technology is neutral. In reality, technology is always already embedded in social, economic, and political contexts. So we can't develop a technology and then think about the politics and the power in the application of the technology because they're braided through from the very beginning, power, politics, and technology. So where does that leave us if technology is to live up to its living better promise? One, the unfettered model of innovation is fundamentally broken because of this environment of global scale and complexity. We need interdisciplinary, diverse teams from the get-go. We need design of technology that recognizes the limits of technological control. That is not just a failure of imagination not to be able to predict how technologies will be used. It's inherent in the nature of technology. We got here by not understanding the political and social aspects of technology and innovation. However, since we're not likely to solve the problem of innovation culture this evening, what do we do as individuals to live better with our social technologies? Well, I would say make friends with the idea that frictionless and efficient isn't better all the time. As social animals, optimization can be suboptimal when it separates us from others. And to return to the start of my seven minutes and what we consider a technology, hold that technology at the moment where you see what's gained and lost for yourself. So not not using social media, say, but holding it at the place where you still know what it's like not to be in the realm of likes and follows. Have a stance towards those big technology companies that allows you to be on them, but not of them to retain your own critical distance, your own deeply human, non-technological ability to connect with other people. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ursula Eicher. Imagine rebuilding our cities while taking climate change serious. That means building cities that use energy responsibly, a green, accessible, people-centric city. Where would you start? I wouldn't want to talk about next generation cities, so much shorter name than what you heard before and why our living better depends on them. A next generation city is something new, a truly sustainable, livable urban space, not just defined by cars. And to get there, we have to get net zero. So what does that mean? Net zero means the total amount of energy used by a building, a city is provided by renewables. And lots of it should be produced locally. It means the carbon footprint of buildings, infrastructure, and transportation needs to be drastically reduced. Because only if we decarbonize our cities to net zero can we have a real sustainable future. And at the same time, it will help to create green, accessible, and people-centric cities. So why does energy matter so much, at least to me? 
Um, well, global warming has been mentioned. It's very urgent on our agenda. We have a climate crisis and we rely still very strongly on fossil fuels, which are the main cause of global warming. And energy is everywhere and yet invisible in our lives. It comes out of a plug, it comes out of a petrol station, and we think very little of where it comes from, how it is produced, and we know even less where it's wasted. So if you look at the city block, what if we knew how much energy was consumed and at the same time, how much could we produce from local solar or even from waste? We could make much smarter choices about energy sharing in that block and then extend it to the community or even the entire city. My work is about radically transforming the urban energy system, finding out where cities consume energy and where we could produce it with renewables and then making this energy visible and calculating scenarios, how do we get to a zero carbon future? How do we create these sustainable and at the same time resilient communities that cover their own energy needs? There's no app for this, no simple solution, and that shows us how a city could work with renewables only. I mean, data certainly helps to make smarter decisions to reduce consumption, and it's very important to become more literate about energy consumption. Why? Because we are incredibly overspending. Our ecological footprint is 1.7 times higher than what the planet can regenerate. And that's one of our main problems just now. So renewables are one of the solutions. It, they bring us to move away from our reliance on fossil fuels. We need to radically change the transportation system. We need to improve our building efficiency and retrofit the existing buildings to make them more efficient. And at the same time, it would be warmer and more comfortable in winter. So all this is essential for the next generation city. But it's obviously more than just energy. It needs to be inclusive, affordable for everybody to create lively communities. And I completely agree, we need to radically share resources, um, not just energy. The group that I lead at Concordia brings together scientists, sociologists, philosophers, artists, working together to try to, to figure out what means living better um, in a next generation city, a next generation approach. So let's have a look at um, sharing of transportation. I mean, technologies help to connect people who move in the same direction. It facilitates um, public transport. It makes it obviously much easier to share cars or bikes. So why would you want to own a very expensive car if you could always have access to a, to a shared car or a shared bike? And not to speak of expensive parking fees in the cities. I mean, if you think of the potential, how much space that could free up in a city for much more green, more bike lanes, more public spaces for people to communicate and um, put together the civic in engagement that was mentioned. So living better in a next generation city will mean to try to adjust to new ways of getting around. The same about the same sharing ideas could be applied to buildings. I mean, just now our need for space is still continuously on the increase and people still feel alone and lonely in their large homes. There are now pretty exciting co-housing projects around where you still have some private space, but the focus is on um, providing interesting and communicative um, public spaces for for things like kitchens, guest rooms, home offices, even more. I firmly believe that we would really live better if we share with the people we like. How we find those is another question. <laughs> <laughs> the new sharing par paradigm envisions models of sharing that are not always commercial, but communal, because that encourages trust and collaboration best. Next generation cities rely on, on sharing, not just cars, but we heard about services, food, activities like childcare, sports, or civic engagement. I think that sharing and, and solidarity offers a powerful alternative for urban futures compared to the conventional race to the bottom narratives of competition, enclosure, and division. And I very much like a saying by the former mayor of Bogota, Enrique Penalosa, and he said, an advanced democratic city is not one where even the poor own a car, but one where the rich ride the bus. 
So living better in the next generation city means radically changing our cities. Smarter energy use, renewable production and rethinking how we move, share and live with one another. We're working on solutions for the next generation cities to make a real, livable and inclusive, sustainable place. Are you ready to join? Good evening. My name is Vivek Venkatesh. To be quite honest, I feel like a fraud speaking to you today about how my work might help us to live better. That's because my research, my art, my creative writing, they're all inspired by my hate. So living better through hate, that doesn't really have a great ring to it. <laughs> this being said, I do work on how to untangle hate, how to get beyond polarizing conversations and the constant othering that can fuel this hate. My teaching, my films, my performances are about creating spaces where we can engage in discussions about the issues at stake without these conversations degenerating into a series of personal attacks. I play in two bands, Landscape of Hate and Landscape of Hope, both of which provoke, titillate, and challenge audiences to confront their conceptions of hate. And all of this work is wrapped in a frame of social pedagogy. This is a way of constantly reflecting and articulating your position in relation to other perspectives, including where you so profoundly disagree with the other. Imagine being so agile that you stop othering those with whom you disagree. In social pedagogy, not only should you not turn a deaf ear to those whose opinions are different from your own, you must seek to understand the rationale for such divergences in opinion, including where you feel a deep-seated anger resentment, and yes, even hatred. So what can social pedagogy look like? Like this, plural. This is a mobile app that we've designed and we're using in workshops currently with youth from marginalized communities. So workshop participants, our youth collaborators, use plural to share multimedia stories that describe their experiences with discrimination, with how they cope with being marginalized. But unlike other social media platforms, Plural does away with the three features that define social media, liking, commenting, sharing. Each story stands on its own, not reliant on the knee-jerk reactions that are dominant in social media. And this is social pedagogy in action, learning to listen to multiple points of view and respecting the stories of those who are most often excluded. Youth who've used plural with us, both in Norway and in Canada, have spoken to us about how they're constantly searching for that search button, that share button, that like, where can I comment? And that being forced to take a step back and think and reflect is surprisingly much more helpful than succumbing to an oft vacuous and indignant outrage. I'm very proud of our work that shines a light on the insidious effects of hate. So why do I still feel like a fraud? Because in a way my work has also been driven by my own experience of being hateful. And it's taken me the better part of my adult life to come to terms with hate as a transformative emotion. Because I believe I found my humanism by learning to hate. So let me just take you back a little bit. The date I learned to hate, June 23, 1985. On that day, my cousin, Sukumar Chandrasekhar, was on his way home to us in India from Canada. Uh, he just completed his MBA at the University of Saskatchewan. He died on the ill-fated Kanishka, Air India Flight 182, and it was blown apart by terrorists acting in the name of Sikh separatism. I was a precocious nine years of age, and I was waiting at the airport for him, and I doted on Sukumar. Uh, he was everything I wanted to be, you know, handsome, smart, gentle, loving. I hope I can be those four. He'd coax me out of my boyhood shyness and introduce me to the joys of reading fiction. And I went through successive and iterative phases of sorrow and helplessness, and loss, and despair. But most of all, I remember feeling really empty. And I remember filling that emptiness with hate. You see, I had a, a cognitive dissonance of sorts. A few months before these Sikh terrorists snatched Sukumar from me, I'd lived the horrors of the New Delhi riots following the assassination of then Prime Minister Indra Gandhi by her bodyguards. My family harbored innocent Sikh families who were fleeing these rabid rioters. 
But when Sukumar died, all I could think about was how ironic it was that the terrorists could not extend the same humanism to him that my family had extended to their brethren. But my family taught me that the actions of a fanatical few don't represent the whole, and that resilience to hate comes from accepting the other within ourselves. So today, 34 years after Sukumar's murder, I realize that my hate has guided me to living better. I've committed my work to developing practical tools that give voice to those who suffer from being othered. That's our brand of social pedagogy. Social pedagogy is about drawing you out of your echo chambers. We all have them, these spaces that are inhabited by only those who share our opinions. This doesn't mean that I propose that somehow we must be in constant conflict with one another, especially with those whose views are very different from our own. Social pedagogy is instead the means by which you can listen to multiple perspectives and spend time reflecting on the differences between the us and the them. This is important to understand for not only those of us who have to cope with the effects of discrimination, but also for those who dish out the hate. Take, for example, a key reflection of participants in a recent project where our team interviewed former right-wing extremists. Amongst other things, we wanted to know how these extremists joined their fringe movements, what motivated them to stay, and all of these participants recounted how, when they were young, they had been exposed to hateful rhetoric about the other. And they all regretted not having the familial and communal structures that might have helped them to see the error of their ways. To think of where I might have gone should I have given in to my hate. Hearing divergent opinions, peeking over to inspect the other side of the fence, going beyond your comfort zone to hear another viewpoint, this is social pedagogy. I think often of Sukumar, and the 328 others who perished on the Kanishka. And yes, sometimes I still hate those who killed him, but I've learned to listen beyond the cacophony of indignance and to not fall into the trap of arriving at a consensus through a dilution of viewpoints. Instead, I've learned to take a step back, to listen and to not give in to the vapidity of mere outrage. So I'm not a fraud. Understanding hate does make for living better. June 23, 1985, I discovered my humanism within my hate. Thank you. I'm Dr. Jen Gunter, and we're going to talk about the hymen. I mean, what else did you expect from me? Medically speaking, the hymen is the membranous fold that partially or wholly occludes the external orifice of the vagina. However, for most societies and religions, it is a membranous fold that determines if a girl or a woman is pure, if she is untouched, if she is worthy of marriage. Her tightness, her pain on penetration, the blood-stained sheets will be celebrated, and not just by her husband. She may heave a sigh of relief when she sees those blood-stained sheets because women are even murdered for want of a hymen. Both ancient and modern cultures, including so-called progressive ones with evolutionary biologists, would have you believe the hymen evolved for virginity. If the first sex were bloody and painful, then there would be resulting pregnancy would clearly be his. And it's interesting that the word hymen comes from Greek for membrane, and coincidentally or not, hymen is also the Greek god of marriage, here I assume adorned by virgins. Except the hymen is a highly unreliable virginity indicator. Less than one-third of women have bleeding with first penile penetration, and even then, there's only a spot of blood, because the hymen has few blood vessels. I know, I've operated on them, and they often do not bleed, even when cut with a scalpel. In addition, 50% of teen girls who have had sex with a penis still have an intact hymen. So it makes no sense to expend a lot of evolutionary resources for an unreliable virginity indicator to prove paternity for a pregnancy that might not even happen because the chance of getting pregnant from a single episode of sex is about two to 5%. Then you have to factor in infant mortality, which is at least 50% back in the day. So wedding night sex had about a one to 2% chance of producing an heir. Evolution does not invest 
in the 1% to 2% chance of survival. Another proposed theory is the hymen evolved to make first sex painful, so women would only have sex with a bonded partner. This assumes men care not for their partner's pleasure. It also ignores the fact that first sex is not painful for two-thirds of women. It is as if people who invent these theories have never actually asked any woman what happens when she has sex with a man. Also, if the evolutionary goal were to keep first sex disappointing, why have a fully functional clitoris years before the capacity to reproduce? <laughs> if sex is supposed to suck, why have a clitoris at all? To get to these answers, let's look at the biology, which evolved long before a marriage existed. Now, I was told not to have highly technical images, so I drew the key embryological stages myself. <laughs> And so now I'm sure you'll remember them. <laughs> so in red, we have primitive structure called the, meso the mesonephric ducts. And in blue, we have the urogenital sinus. And the top third of the vagina comes from the mesonephric ducts, and the bottom two thirds comes from the blue, the urogenital sinus. And they join, and they merge, and they form a big solid tube, and then that big solid tube hollows out. And there's a few cells left at the bottom, and so you have the hollow tube of the vagina with a hymen. So it seems unlikely this complex embryology would be to suit the evolutionary pressures of needing a virgin bride. I can certainly accept that physical features attract males, but no other structure evolved for the social purpose of marriage. So if the hymen were biologically speaking, though, about marriage, I want to bring in another point. Why do cats have hymens? Why do dogs have hymens? Why do horses have hymens? Why do camels? Why do buffaloes? And why do elephants? In fact, the elephant's hymen doesn't break until its first delivery. If you wanted to prove paternity from a pregnancy from your virginal bride conceived on your wedding night, you would want an elephant's hymen. You wouldn't want a human hymen. And yes, elephants don't get married. So what we do know from science is the hymen is quite rigid at birth and provides a more robust covering of the vaginal opening, and then it starts to change. And by the age of three, it's very less rigid, and the shape and elasticity change with age. This is because the hymen has served its purpose, protecting the infant vagina from urine and feces. Because before puberty, the vagina is very sensitive to irritants. So a mechanical barrier that's in place until continence kicks in makes sense. So you were going to see a picture of me when I was three, because I was super cute. And then you were, <laughs> you were also going to see a picture of me when I was 20 and desperately wanted to be Pat Benatar. Um, also, that picture was taken the day after I had had sex for the first time. <laughs> and I was going to ask you, what did I have at the age of three that I lost at the age of 20? My baby teeth. Get your minds out of the gutter. And that's how you should think of the hymen. Like baby teeth, it exists for a narrow developmental stage. And then once it has served its purpose, it takes on a variety of shapes and flexibility. Because at that point, it's not needed. So you should think about the hymen as something carrying, covering a narrow developmental phase. And once it's taken on, once we've done with it biologically, we don't need it anymore. And in fact, the whole reason it becomes flexible and pliable is so we can have sex without pain. Because if sex hurt a lot, people actually wouldn't do it. So what about those bloody sheets? This is a painting of a bedding ceremony. Could you imagine having sex with all those people watching? Um, you know, I can pretty much get it on any time, but that might affect me. <sighs> I'm telling you, I might have a limit to the number who can watch. So if sex is twist a nipple and stick it in, or if it's rape, then you get vulvar and vaginal lacerations. Sexual incompetence and sexual violence is what brings bloodied sheets, not a disrupted hymen. So we should no more judge a woman's virginity with her hymen than we should with her baby teeth. And I would like to remind everybody that virginity is a social construct, and please keep biology out of it.
Hi, I'm Damian Rogers, and I wanted to say thank you to the Walrus for inviting me to speak to you tonight on the subject of better living. It's actually my mother's 70th birthday today, and she would have loved this topic if she could be here. Her favorite magazine, when she could still read, was Prevention, which if you're not familiar with it, I mean, it's no walrus. It's dedicated to celebrating the lifestyle of better living. Eat right, exercise, keep a gratitude journal, you know, all that jazz. I used to joke that my mother was going to outlive us all. But almost a decade ago, my health-conscious mother was diagnosed with dementia at the age of 61. What I'd like to talk about tonight is what I've learned about living better from witnessing the progression of my mother's illness. When my mother was first diagnosed, she wasn't able to accept it. She was understandably terrified. She lived alone, she'd lost her job, she didn't even live in the same country as her only child. It was too much. In a state of desperation, she began a mnemonic project of her own design. She tried to memorize a list of 150 animal names. I didn't know where this idea came from. It seemed like her plan was that she was going to memorize this list so that she could prove to the doctors that there was nothing wrong with her. She copied this list out over and over and over. She filled notebooks, sketchbooks, the inside jacket covers of novels and self-help books, all with these names of different animals. Even after she entered an assisted living facility, she continued to compulsively copy out this list. I think it became a way for her to focus her fear into some kind of activity, and I think the repetition of it was at least a little bit calming. I even found the names of animals scrawled across two of her pillowcases. I couldn't help but picture these animals running through her dreams. My mother wasn't the only one who was afraid. I became terrified that this was gonna happen to me too. But I wasn't gonna bury my head in the sand. I wasn't gonna hide from the truth. I was gonna spit into a mail order DNA test tube. And I found out that I do actually carry a copy of the APOE4 gene, which does increase my risk of developing dementia. So I began to do all the research that I could. I gathered information, tried to pay attention to the current science, which, you know, if you do, it's always changing, just to find out what is recommended that I could do to decrease this risk. I take a heroic dose, dose of curcumin every day, swallow spoonfuls of fancy fish oil, along with a host of other supplements. I bike to work, I meditate, I drink tea. I eat blueberries and greens and sweet potatoes. I started to police my own cognitive health. I'd freak out whenever I switched up words saying salsa instead of hummus or forgot the name of an acquaintance. On my worst day, I was cooking, following five different complicated health food recipes, solo parenting and packing for a writing retreat all at the same time. I was melting a quarter cup of coconut oil on the stove when my son called me into the living room. He showed me something in his dinosaur book and I, I sat down and I totally spaced out about the oil on the stove until the smoke alarm went off. And when I ran back into the kitchen, there was a column of flame about three feet high rising out of the saucepan. I panicked. I couldn't remember what you're supposed to do for a grease fire. I knew it wasn't water. It's not water. I threw water on it. Um, my son was screaming, make it stop. It was a mess. Um, you know, I cleaned it up. The house didn't burn down. Later, I texted my husband, and I said, you know, I'm really worried about my brain. And he texted me back, dude, no offense, but you've been burning pots since I met you in 1998. <laughs> Still, I made an appointment for a full cognitive health evaluation. 
Towards the end of the exam, the doctor conducting the test asked me to list as many animal names <laughs> as I could in two minutes. And I smiled. I mean, I suddenly understood where my mother's list came from, you know, this bargaining exercise we do. And I also saw that in trying to face the specter of this illness head on, that I too had lost myself in my own lists. Before I leave you, I want to tell you what it's like for me to spend time with my mother now and how I've learned to get past at least some of that fear. My mother no longer knows my name. She couldn't explain who I am to anyone who might ask her, who is this Joanna? But we still find each other in a space past language. I play old songs she used to love to sing with me when I was a child on my phone. Sometimes she knows the words to the chorus, sometimes she hums the melody. These are the moments that I feel the closest to her. No matter how anxious I am before I see her, when we're sitting together like that singing, I am filled with gentleness and patience, and I'm completely present. It's in this way that she's teaching me how to treat myself with that same kindness. Because sometimes the ghost of an old fear, usually about money, will bubble up inside my mother while we're together. And we ride through it like a wave. Her body stiffens, her face clouds. She might mutter something about a bill. I hold her hand. I speak in a calm voice, and it passes. We turn our attention back to the music. A line will suddenly leap forward. Maybe James Taylor singing, I always thought I'd see you again. And our eyes will well up as we sing that line together. And there we are, just there. And it's better. Thank you. Here's to living better in ways you might not thought about until tonight. And join me in thanking the seven of them for that. So thank you to Nick Saul, Nora Young, Ursula Ecker, Zaya Tong, Vivek Venketesh, Jen Gunter, and Damian Rogers. And um, just before I have a few more things to, to say to the rest of you, I'm going to ask the seven of them, along with Anne from Concordia, stand up and exit out the back. I'm going to keep the audience for a few minutes. Yes, you can clap for them on their way. We'll see you at the reception in a few minutes, everybody. I want to thank Concordia University again. There's no way that we can do the work we do without our partner's support. I want to tell you that we've now produced 119 Walrus Talks evenings on every subject that you can think of, which means there are now more than 800 seven-minute Walrus Talks videos that you can watch whenever and wherever you are. It's free. Just go to our YouTube channel at thewalrus.ca. What is not free is the cost of creating fact-based journalism. So you can, when you get to the reception tonight, you can subscribe at a table out there. It's incredible to me that our actual director of circulation and audience engagement is at that table. His name is Brian Maloney, and he'd be really happy to sell you a full year's print subscription to the Walrus for just $25 tonight. As you all know, fake, fake news is really cheap, and one of the reasons fact-based journalism is expensive is we have real live human fact-checkers, which in this day and age we do not believe should be 
a luxury. So please consider subscribing and also please consider joining our community of more than 2,000 supporters across the country who support our work. And the support is really essential. And tonight, a, even a small gift would make an enormous impact because we have a generous couple, Tim and Francis Price, who are going to match you dollar for dollar. So if you donate $10, it automatically, like magic, becomes 20. And if you make a donation tonight of $100 or more, you will get a much coveted walrus tote bag. Yes, you will. So you can do all that in the reception. You can do all that uh, at thewalrus.ca. Please also sign up for our newsletter. That's free. It'll make sure you don't miss any more Walrus Talks. We're back in Toronto, Jane Mallet Theatre on Tuesday, November 26, for the Walrus Talks Women of Distinction. I'd like to thank Anne Whitelaw, Sammy Antaki, Philippe Beauregard, Joanne Pelche, and everyone at Concordia University for your support. Thank you again to the Concordia alumni for being here with us tonight. And a special thanks to Gina Cody for all you have done for Concordia and science and engineering. The engineering school at Concordia is named after Gina Cody, and she's with us tonight. Yes. And I'd like to thank our national partners who go with us everywhere we go. Inspire, Labatt Breweries of Canada, Air Canada, and Shaw. And please join us at the reception. There is food, there is drink. If you are there, there will be good conversation because the truth is, we are not the walrus. You are the walrus. Good night. Good night.